Hello and welcome to the second video in our series for World Bee Day about an introduction to pollinators and bees. You can find links to all three videos in the description below. This series comes from the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, which is implemented by the National Biodiversity Data Centre. The All Ireland Pollinator Plan is a framework bringing together businesses, councils, farmers, schools, organisations and individuals across the island of Ireland to create a landscape where pollinators can survive and thrive. In the last video, you will have heard about the different types of pollinators we have in Ireland and why they are in trouble. Today, I'm going to talk about the top 10 things you can do to help them. As you will have heard in the last video, pollinators are under threat because of the loss of habitat that provides them with food and shelter and crucially food. The good news is there are very simple actions we can take to help improve and restore our landscape for them. And today I'm going to focus on a general overview of our top recommendations and I hope there will be something in there to inspire all of you in whatever space you have. At the very top, of our recommendation list is don't mow, let it grow. And reducing mowing is the absolute best thing you can do for pollinators. As we saw in the last video, pollinators are in trouble due to the loss of food and habitat, what we call species rich grassland, which includes a wide variety of native wildflowers that our pollinators have evolved alongside. Reducing mowing allows native wildflowers like dandelions, clover and bird's foot trefoil to naturally return over time. There are a few different options for reducing mowing depending on the space you have. You could create a short flowering meadow, which is a cut every six weeks starting in mid-April to allow the first dandelions to emerge. And this allows clover to appear later in the year on a rotational basis. Or you could do a long flowering meadow, which is cut once a year in September, allowing the seeds to drop in August, which then seeds the meadow for the following year. This can take a couple of years to fully establish because at first the soil will be too fertile to support a lot of wildflowers, which is also why some of you might have had problems with wildflower seed mixes in your lawn. And I'll talk a little bit about this later. So when you're mowing your lawn um, at those times, it's crucial to remember to remove the grass cuttings, which will help reduce the fertility of the soil over time. And you can do this everywhere and anywhere. It doesn't just have to be your lawn. It can be roadside verges, schools, parks, anywhere where there's grass. Any space makes a difference. And if you can't spare a whole lawn, you could also just do a strip. And we've got a couple of guidelines on uh, reducing mowing and we'll put links to those in the description of this video. Our second recommendation is to protect and create native hedgerow. This includes hawthorn, also called white thorn and black thorn. These flower in spring, which provide food for pollinators when they emerge for hibernation. And yes, as you would have heard in the last video, and that might have surprised um, some of you, that bees actually hibernate. Queen bees emerge in early spring and start to look for somewhere to nest. And at this time, they need access to thousands of flowers. So this early food is vital for them. And the more blossom your hedgerow has in spring, the better it is for biodiversity. And the crucial thing to remember is that if you're managing a hedgerow, allow it to grow in a natural A-shaped profile. And remember that flowers grow on older wood. So avoid cutting annually because otherwise you won't have that blossom in the spring. Cut on a three three year rotation instead at most to allow them to flower, um, although obviously not uh, at this time of year. We're in May at the moment um, and it's against the law to cut hedges at this time of year. You could also add a native plant to your hedge. You don't have to have acres of fields and hedgerows and farms. Even if you just have a garden with a, with a bit of a hedgerow, you can add a native plant into that and that'll make a difference. Our third recommendation is plant pollinator friendly trees. Native trees and shrubs like willow, rowan, crabapple and holly support huge numbers of insects, including pollinators. And like hedges, these also flower quite early. So they're important in the same way that hedgerows are for those emerging pollinators. More broadly, they contribute to a healthy climate and biodiversity and support a rich variety of organisms like lichens, birds and mammals, particularly as they get older. So you could plant a young tree in the autumn or winter, or you could even grow them from seed. And you can also get small varieties which are good for smaller gardens. So again, you don't need a huge amount of space. Number four is avoid pesticides, and this is a big one. 
Pesticides include herbicides, insecticides and fungicides. These are potent chemical cocktails designed to kill various organisms and one of the best things you can do for pollinators is avoid using them. They've been found to kill, harm and disorientate pollinators either directly through exposure or indirectly by killing or poisoning their food. If you buy plants at a garden centre, ask if they've been treated with chemicals because even the ones that are labelled bee friendly might have been treated with pesticides. And part of this is also about changing how we view weeds. These plants are often vital food sources for pollinators. Here on the right is a summary of over 1800 bee records that were sent to us in 2021, which included information about what the bee was feeding on. So this is basically a top 10 list of a bee's favourite food. Dandelions, as you can see at the top here, were the most popular by far. There were more than double the number of sightings of bees on dandelions compared to the next plant down. And even with other factors taken into consideration, this indicates a clear favourite. If you have to remove some plants, avoid using chemicals and do it by hand. Or if that isn't possible, there are, there are some trials being done at the moment with organic alternatives. Some councils use heat treatments and also salt water and vinegar have been used, which at least doesn't add poison to the food chain. And just a note before I move on, herbicides should still be used to remove invasive species such as Japanese knotweed where there's no other alternative, but other than that, avoid them altogether. Number five is create nesting habitats. Again, this might come as a surprise, but most bees don't live in beehives. Wild pollinators nest in hedgerows, in wild grassy areas, dry stone walls and even in the ground. And again, there was a bit more on that in the last talk. To make a nesting habitat for them, all you need to do is scrape back some bare earth, leave some areas to grow wild or simply drill holes 10 centimetres deep in unvarnished wood for cavity nesting bees. We've already seen it's important that bees have a food source near their nest. So choose areas that have flowers nearby. And here in the picture, you can see a, a common card bee flying out of a grass nest. Number six is pollinator friendly planting. And this is something that we're in May at the moment. A lot of you will be thinking about quite a bit. Um, whether you have a garden, a balcony or a window box, you can choose plants that, are, that will help pollinators. And the key thing to bear in mind when you're planning what to plant is to choose plants that will flower throughout the year. In the last talk, um, Una spoke a bit about climate change and how important it is to make sure that we are providing a food source throughout the year for pollinators as our as our climate changes. We're seeing that pollinators are um, foraging at times of the year they wouldn't have traditionally. So it's important to make sure that we've got that food source for them available all year round. The other key thing to bear in mind is that the plants you choose must be a good source of nectar and pollen, which provides pollinators with energy and protein. And you might be surprised to hear that some popular plants like daffodils, tulips and begonias are not great sources of nectar and pollen. Generally, perennials are better than annuals. And here on the right is an example of one of our planting guidelines that gives you advice on what to plant throughout the year. And um, again, we can put a link to that in the description below. So, for example, plants like bidens and bacopa are great bedding plants for small containers and hanging baskets. Herbs like thyme and rosemary provide food for you as well as pollinators. And you could also plant bulbs in the autumn like snowdrops, crocuses and grape hyacinth, which again provide that source of early food in, um, this, in the spring when pollinators emerge from hibernation. We will soon also be releasing a top 10 planting list, which has advice on the top plants you can um, add into various areas and soil types. So keep an eye out for that. And the last thing to say before I move on is that uh, make sure you keep these plants to garden areas and don't plant them in the wider landscape. Outside your garden, the best action for pollinators is to encourage the return of species rich grassland by reducing mowing. So the next three things are a few things you need to be a little bit wary of. And the first of those is think twice about getting a hive of honeybees. And the first thing to say is that all pollinators are important and have a role to play. But on the island of Ireland, as you heard in the last talk, we have one native honeybee species. It's managed by beekeepers and fortunately it's not in decline. 
Most honeybees uh, live in hives and are managed, as you would have seen in the last talk, but if we have too many honeybee hives in the landscape, they can compete for food with our wild pollinators, which are already struggling. You should only get a honeybee hive if you want to start a new hobby, but it's not an action for biodiversity or if you want to support wild bees. If you're thinking about getting a hive of honeybees, please get in touch with your local beekeeping association to learn about how to keep healthy honeybees, avoiding spreading disease to other hives and to our struggling wild honey um, wild pollinators. And there are loads of fantastic beekeeping associations around the island of Ireland who are doing great work and they'll be able to help you. The next one is be careful with wildflower seed mixes. And earlier I spoke about creating more areas for wildflowers by reducing mowing and you might have wondered why I didn't suggest sowing wildflower seeds. You might be surprised to hear that sowing wildflower seed mixes can actually damage local biodiversity. Many wildflower seed mixes have been found to contain non-native species and can inadvertently introduce invasive species, so they will not necessarily result in that all-important species-rich grassland that we spoke about earlier. So approach these with caution, and if you do decide to sow wildflower seed mixes, keep them to your garden in pots and make sure they're native and of Irish origin. Alternatively, there is a way you can collect and sow seeds from local wildflowers when they drop their seeds in the late summer. And again, we have instructions on how to do that that we can put in the video description. We also have new dedicated pages on our website with more information about the problems with wildflower seed mixes, and we can put a link in for that as well. The next one is don't install a large insect hotel. Insect hotels or bee hotels provide nesting habitat for cavity nesting bees, but if they're too big, they can encourage the spread of disease and attract predators. So we recommend avoiding anything bigger than an average size bird box and keep it away from bird feeders so the insects aren't easy targets for predators. And there are many other ways to create nesting habitats for pollinators, which I spoke about earlier, and we've got guidelines on that too. And finally, spread the word and get involved. There are loads of guidelines that we have available on our website for different kinds of groups and organisations, including councils, community groups, sports clubs, schools and businesses. Change happens when word spreads and even just talking to one person about what you've heard today could lead to a change in how a crucial habitat is managed. And eventually we will have a network of habitats that are fantastic for pollinators. And I can't stress enough how much fantastic work is taking place all over the country because of the work of community groups and tidy towns. Tidy towns have an annual pollinator award, which we are involved in administrating, and the work that they're doing is phenomenal. They really are leading the way in showing what can be achieved when we work together across communities. And here's Bunkrana Tidy Towns in Donegal, who won the pollinator award in 2021. So that brings me to the end. Um, there's a link for the resources that I mentioned in the talk description, but I would encourage you to visit our website pollinators.ie to find loads of different guidelines on uh, all of the things I've spoken about today. There's also free signage templates that you can download and we've got a free course in how to identify and record common Irish bumblebees. And our next talk will be a little be a bit more about recording and why that's important and how you can help us record um, the pollinators in our landscape. So today I've covered a lot of ground, but I just want to stress that even doing one of these things can make a difference. And hopefully you're already thinking about how you can use the principles that we've spoken about today. So get outside, take a look. And once you start looking for bees and pollinators, you really will see them everywhere. And you'll start to see how your garden or your local area can be part of a network of healthy habitats for them. Together, we can create an island where pollinators can survive and thrive. <laughs>